In this episode of Trekking Through Compliance, we review the episode, The Omega Glory. Compliance, the final frontier. Tom Fox is the voyager of Trekking Through Compliance. His mission, to explore the original series and seek out and share what it can teach you about compliance. Here's your host, Tom Fox. Trekking Through Compliance, Episode 52, The Omega Glory. In this episode of Trekking Through Compliance, we consider the episode The Omega Glory, which aired on March 1, 1968, and occurred on Stardate Unknown. Story synopsis. As the Enterprise approaches planet Omega-4, they discover the Exeter in orbit. However, no one is aboard. Kirk, Spock, and Galloway beam aboard the ship and find that the ship left on automatic pilot. Empty uniforms are strewn everywhere, and there seems and they seem to be filled with some sort of white crystal. McCoy analyzes the crystals and finds that they contain the elements of the human body when 96% of its water is taken away. The boarding party then plays the medical log and are warned they are dead men. They are warned that they must not return to their ship and told their only chance for survival is to beam down to the planet's surface and find Captain Ron Tracy. On Omega-4, they find Tracy, who together with Li Yang and Wu, is in the process of torturing a pair of savage Yangs. Kirk, Spock, Galloway, and Bones discover that they have been contaminated with a substance which removes all water from bodies of human, but that the surface of the planet of Omega-4 produce, produces a natural immunization against the contaminant. Captain Tracy has apparently become mentally unstable, and Kirk finds that he has been interfering with the planet's development. Spock and Galloway are attacked by the Yangs while on a fact-finding mission, but Kirk has already discovered the discarded power packs, which Tracy has used to slaughter hundreds of Yangs. However, when Kirk attempts to communicate this fact to the Enterprise, he is confronted by a tracer-bearing, phaser-bearing Tracy. To show he means business, Tracy vaporizes Galloway with his hand phaser. Tracy contacts the Enterprise and claims that the landing party has been found unconscious. Kirk blurts out a warning to Sulu, but is knocked unconscious by the comms. Tracy is convinced that the substance in the atmosphere which protects them from death will also prolong human life and cites the fact that Wu has lived to 462 years old and his father is more than 1,000 years old as evidence. He is obsessed by finding the cause and proposed that McCoy isolate it. He wants to sell it to the highest bidder and believe the significance of this discovery outweighs the force of the non-interference doctrine. Kirk attempts to overpower him, but is himself overpowered and then thrown into a cell with the captured Yangs. The male Yang attacks Kirk, but retreats when Spock nerve pinches the female from a neighboring cell. Kirk and Spock then mention the word freedom while plotting a jailbreak, and the Yangs perk up and tell Kirk that he has spoken a worship word. The Yangs then assist Kirk in prying a bar loose from the window, but then proceed to wield it on Kirk's head and make their escape together. Seven hours and eight minutes later, Kirk regains consciousness. He then helps Spock to escape, and they find McCoy. Bones has discovered the virus resulting from a, is results from a biological war in the distant past. Nature has apparently developed a way of conferring immunity to those per- persons who stay on the planet long enough. It therefore appears that the landing party is free to return at any time. Moreover, the crew of the Exeter would have survived if they had only stayed on the planet a bit longer. Bones also determines that the inhabitants live to such old ages because their ancestors weren't usually fit, not because of an age-prolonging serum. In frustration, Tracy attacks Kirk, but Tracy, McCoy, and Spock are all taken prisoners by the victorious Yangs. Kirk realizes that the Yangs and comms are actually distorted forms of Yanks and communists, and this somewhat implausible observation is confirmed when the Yangs display a tattered U.S. flag. A trial headed by Yang leader Cloud William follows. Kirk recognizes the invocation as distorted form of the Pledge of Allegiance and surprises the Yangs by completing it unassisted. Tracy tries to convince Yangs by to kill Kirk by claiming he is a servant of evil, as evidenced by his association with Spock, whose pointy ears match those in, in his ancient book, and who apparently has no heart, at least in the not in the correct anatomical location. 
Kirk attempts to prove his innocence by completing the holy words, and since the Yangs believe that a liar who speaks them will have his tongue burned with fire. When Kirk cannot, Kirk and Tracy are pitted against each other in a fight to the death. Kirk is in trouble until Spock uses a mysterious mental power to cloud, excuse me, to influence Cloud Williams' woman to activate a captured communicator. As the landing party beams down, Kirk has already turned the situation around and has Tracy at knife point. Kirk now realizes that the holy words are the preamble to the U.S. Constitution and reveals the true meaning of the words to Chief William. Kirk and his landing crew return to the Enterprise, bringing Tracy along as a prisoner. Fun fact. One of the great things about Star Trek, the original series, are the novels written around it. In the novel Forgotten History, an investigation revealed that the Enterprise logs and scans indicated the American artifacts were far too intact to be thousands of years old, given the primitive conditions in which the Yang tribe kept them, and they could not have dated back much more than a century. However, it was discovered that the Yangs had never stated that the holy artifacts were ancient, and this was a conclusion Kirk had jumped to. It eventually concluded that in the 2140s, an Earth cargo service freighter, the ECS Philadelphia, had discovered the planet and noting the similarity between Yang beliefs and American ideals had left behind paraphernalia to inspire the Yangs in their fight for freedom. There were many interesting continuity continuity issues in this episode. The Enterprise visits another world possessing a parallel Earth culture. Um, again, Mary, bread and circuses, a piece of the actions, patterns of force, paradise synd- syndrome, and Plato's stepchild, which we will take up uh, down the road a little bit. But these were derived from uh, actual Earth cultures and did not originate independently. This is the second time the Enterprise encounters an Earth-like planet where the humans are centuries old. The first time was Miri. This is the second of three times the Enterprise encounters another Constitution-class starship with the entire crew dead. The others, of course, were the Doomsday Machine and the upcoming Tholian Web. In this, we uh, learn the Exeter has a standard complement of four shuttlecraft. Um... First time we've heard about that. It was also the first time the chief medical officer of another Federation starship is seen here, Dr. Carter. Although he's sitting in the command chair of the bridge, it's unclear if he's in command of the Enterprise or merely recording a warning. It was not until Dr. Beverly Crusher was placed in command of the Enterprise D in Descent Part 2 would a doctor clearly be in charge of a starship. And that's, of course, in Star Trek the, orig- or, uh, the Next Generation. The episode marks the first and only time in the original series where there is reference made to a phaser power pack. And it's the second time in the same season that people are reduced to their component minerals. The first was by the Kelvins, dis- who distilled the crew of the Enterprise down in by any other name. Today, I want to take a look at continuous improvement for compliance through the lens of this episode, The Omega Glory. So how can you do that? Well, number one, encourage transparency and open communication. Promote an environment where employees feel comfortable raising concerns, reporting issues, and providing feedback without fear of retaliation. Establish clear and accessible channels for employees to share their ideas, suggestions, and observations about your compliance program. Next, regularly solicit input from employees at all levels of your organization, not just senior management. Two, implement robust feedback mechanisms. You should develop a structured feedback process that allows employees to provide constructive feedback on your compliance program and its implementation. Conduct regular surveys, focus groups, and town hall meetings to gather insights and identify areas for improvement. And finally, ensure that feedback is actively listened to. Remember, it's not just speak up, it's listen up as well. Evaluate it and use to inform the evolution of your compliance program going forward. Three, cultivate a learning mindset. Encourage a culture that embraces continuous learning and the willingness to adapt and evolve. Provide training and resources to help employees understand the importance of compliance in their role in maintaining a strong culture of integrity. Celebrate successes. 
but also openly discuss and learn from failures or missteps, using them as opportunities for growth and improvement. Four, empower cross-functional collaboration. Foster collaboration between your compliance function and other business units, such as legal HR, IT, ops, finance, etc. Encourage the sharing of knowledge, best practices, and lessons learned across the organization. And finally, facilitate cross-functional working groups or task groups to address complex compliance challenges. Five, recognize and reward compliance champions. Identify and recognize employees who will demonstrate a strong commitment to compliance and willingness to contribute to the continuous improvement of your compliance program. Implement incentive structures or recognition programs that celebrate and reinforce the desired compliance behaviors and mindsets you are seeking to inculcate. Leverage these compliance champions as role models and advocates for the compliance program within your organization. Six, leverage data and analytics. Implement robust data collection and analytics capabilities to monitor the effectiveness of the compliance program. Analyze compliance-related data to identify trends, patterns, and areas for improvement. Use data-driven insights to inform the ongoing refinement and optimization of your compliance programs. And finally, number seven, engage with industry peers and regulators. Actively participate in industry associations, peer groups for regulatory dialogues to stay informed about emerging compliance trends, best practices, and regulatory developments. Leverage these external connections to benchmark your organization's compliance program and identify opportunities for improvement. Collaborate with regulators and the indus- your industry peers in industry groups to share your knowledge and collectively enhance your compliance programs. By implementing some or all of these strategies, compliance professionals can foster a culture of continuous improvement within your organization where employees are empowered to contribute to the ongoing refinement, strengthening, and upgrading of your compliance program. This approach not only enhances the effectiveness of your corporate compliance function, but also promotes a deeper sense of ownership and commitment to compliance across your entire organization. Join us tomorrow where we take up the episode, The Ultimate Computer. If you enjoyed this episode of Trekking Through Compliance, you can help it grow by sharing it with the biggest Trek fan you know. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.